Neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system. So a basic understanding of how they work is crucial to the study of thought, behavior, and emotion. Before we talk about neurons, we'll first give a nod to another important cell type, glia cells. Glia cells are the support cells of the nervous system. The word glia in Greek means glue. This is because it was originally thought that glia were responsible for binding the nervous system together. There are lots of different types of glia cells and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. One type called an astrocyte gets its name from its star-like appearance. Astro is Latin for star. Astrocytes have widespread functions. They provide structural support, they're a source of glucose for neurons when they're hungry, and neurons are always hungry, and they regulate ions and extracellular neurotransmitter levels, which are essential for signaling. Oligodendrocytes are another type of glia cells. However, their function is more limited than astrocytes. They make myelin, a fatty substance that wraps around and insulates a part of the neuron called the axon. Oligodendrocytes are the main myelinating glial type in the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord, while Schwann cells serve the same function of wrapping around and insulating neuron axons, but in the peripheral nervous system, so outside the brain and spinal cord. Nerve cells are called neurons, and their job is to receive and send messages to both one another as well as targets all over the body. So there are information processors. Neurons are incredibly diverse in their shapes, functions, and communication targets. Generally speaking, neurons can first be categorized into two different types. First, those that project to distant targets outside of their local structure. And second, those that project locally to targets within the same structure. Even further, neurons are vastly diverse within each of these general categories. Take for example, three main structures of the nervous system, the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, and the retina. In the top row, you can see three major distant projecting neuron types, Purkinje neurons in the cerebellum, pyramidal neurons in the cerebral cortex, and retinal ganglion cells in the retina. Now, take a look at the bottom row. Here are three examples of locally projecting neurons. Granule cells in the cerebellum, basket cells in the cerebral cortex, and bipolar cells in the retina. Understanding neuronal structure has been at the forefront of neuroscience research since its very beginnings with the pioneering work of Romeo Y. Cajal in the late 1800s. Still to this day, understanding neuronal structure serves as a key factor in understanding the diversity and functions of the nervous system. Now that we understand the importance of neuronal shape, let's take a closer look at how we describe the cellular structure of a typical neuron. Despite their diversity in size and structure, neurons all share common features. The soma, also called the cell body, contains the nucleus and other cellular machinery necessary for the housekeeping functions that all cells need to maintain. Extending from the soma are highly branched structures called dendrites, whose main function is to receive messages from other neurons. As we saw in the last slide, dendritic complexity can differ a lot depending on the neuron type. Neurons with many dendrites will have large total dendritic surface areas, which means they can receive many inputs from many other neurons. Amazingly, some individual neurons have been shown to receive as many as 10,000 inputs on their dendrites. Also extending from the soma is the neuron's axon, which can be thought of as the neuron's highway to its targets. In this case, the target is another neuron, but it could also be a muscle or a gland. When describing the connection between two neurons, we refer to the neuron sending the signal 
as the presynaptic neuron, while we refer to the neuron receiving the signal as the postsynaptic neuron. Neuronal signals or messages are most often passed to the next neuron by neurotransmitters, which are chemical signals typically released at the axon terminals of the presynaptic neuron and received by receptors on the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. It is important to note that while most axon terminals synapse on dendrites, like you see here, axon terminals can also synapse onto other parts of the neuron, such as the soma and axon. The contact points between the presynaptic axon terminals and the postsynaptic dendrites are quite tiny. But if we zoom in a bit closer, we can see much more. At this magnification, we can see little bubbles called synaptic vesicles. And inside these, we can see neurotransmitter molecules. If we focus in now at the tip of the axon terminal, we see vesicles releasing their neurotransmitter contents into the space between the terminal of the sending neuron and the dendrite of the receiving neuron. This space is called the synaptic cleft. The liberated neurotransmitter is then able to bind to receptors on the other side of the synapse and pass the message onto the next neuron. Thus, the arrangement of neurons in relation to the synapse gives us the terminology to describe the direction of information flow. This is why we call the sending neuron the presynaptic neuron as it is found before the synapse, and the receiving neuron as the postsynaptic neuron, as it is found after the synapse. Although this seems fairly straightforward, so far we've been looking at simplified schematics. Real synapses are a bit messier. Let's have a look. This image was taken with an electron microscope and shows the structure of a synapse in the fly brain. It was taken by Nancy Butcher, a former neuroscience student who completed her bachelor's and master's degrees at Dalhousie University. The synapse itself can be identified by the dark staining, representing high electron density. The arrow shows the location of the presynaptic neuron, which is easy to locate because there are lots of little bubbles which are the vesicles containing neurotransmitter. The asterisk shows the postsynaptic contacts. And in this example, the presynaptic neuron makes synaptic contact with not one, not two, not three, not even four, but five separate dendritic branches. So even at a single terminal, there can be lots of places for neurons to communicate with one another. If we classify neurons based on their synaptic connections, it yields three different types. Sensory neurons receive their input from various stimuli in the environment. They tend to have very specialized shapes in order to capture sounds, sights, smells, and other types of information we get from our sensory world. For example, in this reflex arc, we have cutaneous sensory neurons that transmit the sense of touch from the skin into the spinal cord. The second neuron type are interneurons, and they receive their input from and send their output to other neurons. So the communication is exclusively with other neurons. Interneurons are responsible for all the tasks that don't involve direct sensory input or direct motor output. Back to our cutaneous reflex arc, interneurons are located in the spinal cord and receive inputs from the sensory neurons. They then make connections with other neurons in order for the sensory messages to get transmitted to the brain. The final neuron type are motor neurons. Motor neurons receive innumerable inputs from neurons in the brain, spinal cord, and periphery. They are located within the central nervous system and send signals to both muscles and glands throughout the periphery. Thus, they function to regulate not just movement, 
but also hormone release. Again, coming back to our example, motor neurons are the final link in this reflex arc. They receive inputs from upstream interneurons and send signals to peripheral muscles. Thus, the effective communications between sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons allows our nervous system to both sense and respond to our dynamic environments. So far, we have discussed how signals are chemically transmitted across the synaptic cleft from one neuron to another. Further, we have discussed how to classify neurons based on their input and output targets. However, as you may have noticed, the distance between where a neuron might receive a signal at its dendrites and where it releases a signal at its axon terminals can be very large. In some cases, this distance can be over a meter. For example, think about motor neurons in your spinal cord. A single motor neuron may have its dendrites in the spinal cord and its axon terminals all the way down your leg signaling in your calf muscles. Thus, the question is raised, how are signals transmitted from a neuron's dendrites and soma to its axon terminals? The answer lies in the remarkable electrical properties of all neurons. Neurons are different than most other cell types because they can transmit electrical signals along their membranes. Electrical current in neurons is carried by ions, which are particles that carry a positive or a negative charge. Each ion has a concentration gradient, which means that ion may have different concentrations on each side of the neuronal cell membrane. The difference in ion concentrations is made possible by ion pumps, which use energy to maintain the unequal distribution of ions on either side of the membrane. Because of the different concentrations of ions, there is also an electrical gradient which is a term that refers to the difference in charge across the neuronal membrane. If you stick an electrode into a typical neuron to measure the electrical properties at rest when it's not active, you'd find that the inside is slightly more negative than the outside. This is called the resting potential, and in a typical neuron, it is minus 70 millivolts. Let's look at the concentration of different ions across the neuronal membrane. There are many ions in neurons, but these are the major players involved with electrical signaling. First are large negatively charged proteins, which are represented by the symbol A negative and are predominantly found inside the neuron. Next, chloride or Cl negative there is a negative charge and are located mostly outside the neuron. Now let's look at some of the major positively charged ions. First, potassium is a positively charged ion represented by the symbol K positive and found mainly inside the neuron. Unlike potassium, positively charged sodium represented by the symbol Na positive is found mostly outside the neuron. Lastly, calcium, or Ca2 positive, carries a double positive charge and are more abundant outside of the neuron. This different distribution of ions is important for the electrochemical gradient, and that's necessary to provide the driving force for ion movement. Ion movement is essential for the two important jobs of neurons, which enable the signaling from their postsynaptic receptors and then along their axons to their axon terminals. The first job is to transmit a message from the presynaptic neuron across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic neuron. This is achieved by converting a chemical neurotransmitter signal in the synaptic cleft into an electrical signal in the neuron. This occurs at the location in the neuron where it receives synaptic inputs, which is usually in its dendrites. This is a type of signal called a graded potential. The second important job of neurons after receiving a message is to transmit that message along its length from its dendrites to its axon terminals. 
This happens via a type of electrical signal called an action potential. Our neurons are talking to each other all the time, by the millions and millions. Try and picture that, it's mind boggling. Well, fear not. With this figure, we'll outline the two types of electrical signaling using a simplified circuit of just three neurons. Using this circuit, we'll attempt to show the repetitive nature of the signaling process. First, we'll start our signaling process with an action potential in the first neuron. This action potential propagates down the axon of the first neuron until it reaches the axon terminals. Once it has reached the axon terminals, it initiates neurotransmitter release into the synapse between the first neuron and the second neuron. These neurotransmitters are then received by the dendrites of the second neuron, producing graded potentials. Once these graded potentials reach a certain threshold, they initiate another action potential, but this time it's in the second neuron. As we saw before, the action potential propagates down the axon of the second neuron until it reaches the axon terminals, again, initiating neurotransmitter release. Now, neurotransmitter is released into the synapse between the axon terminals of the second neuron and the dendrites of the third neuron, which again, initiates graded potentials, except this time in the third neuron. This process then repeats onto four, five, six, and millions of other neurons. Knowing the structure of neurons and the signaling types in neurons are important first steps in understanding their functions. Ultimately, the output of the nervous system, which governs our movements, thoughts, and behaviors, are determined by how different neuron types send and receive signals with one another.